This is AQA Air Level Physics Paper 2 from 2021, Year 2 content. As per usual, can't show the paper on screen unfortunately, otherwise AQA will get the whole channel deleted, like they almost did in the past. The links to the paper and mark scheme are in the description. If you find this helpful, then please leave a like, and if you really find it helpful, then consider putting a tip in the jar by clicking the super thanks button, really helps me keep making these videos. Question one, we have a capacitor that has a capacitance of 63 picofarad. To tell you what, let's write that in terms of just farads. So 63 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. And we're told that the charge stored in it is 7.6 times 10 to the minus 10 coulombs. We have a relative permittivity of 6. What is meant by a dielectric constant of 6? We can say that dielectric has a permittivity six times that of free space. 1.2, micro is made up of polar molecules. As the micro is inserted, the capacitance of the capacitor changes. Explain how the polar molecules cause this change in capacitance. They like a very specific way of putting this. So what we say is that, well, we have the positive and negative plate, don't we? Of the capacitor and the polar molecules, which we can draw as just little peanuts. They line up opposite ends attracted to the plates. So we can say molecules align with fuel lines, and that is positive end attracted to negative plate and vice versa. So that's our first point. Second point is this one that's a little bit like, oh, what is this talking about? But we don't necessarily need to understand it too well. We just need to say it. This produces electric field that counters field produced by plates. There's two things that can happen next. It depends whether it's isolated or not. It is isolated, so that means that Q stays constant because charge can't leak away. Therefore, as Q equals VC, Q staying the same, V goes down, so that means capacitance goes up. So we can say V decreases, C increases. Of course, if it was still attached to the power supply battery, then V would have to stay the same. So that would mean that the charge would change instead. It would be the charge that decreases. 1.3, calculate the difference in energy. So we know that energy stored in a capacitor is equal to either half QV, or we can replace both of those, half CV squared, and also half Q squared over C. We're looking for the energy difference. So that's equal to the difference in energies. We can't just stick a difference. None of these Q, Vs or Cs in our equation are changing those things. So we can't just put the change in there. So we're given the capacitance to begin with. We're given this, aren't we as well? And we're given the charge as well. So let's crack out our capacitance equation. And that is A epsilon zero epsilon R over D. So we can find out the energy to begin with. We can use a half Q squared over C. So equal to a half times this charge here, squared over 63 picofarads. And it gives us 4. Point, let's go 5.8 times 10 to the minus 9 joules. There is a shortcut here, but we're going to do it the long way around. We know from our capacitance equation, capacitance is equal to A epsilon 0 epsilon R divided by D. They're all staying the same, and so we can say that capacitance is proportional to epsilon R. So therefore, if epsilon r goes up by times six, then therefore so does the capacitance. So if that's happening, then that means that the energy goes down by a factor of six because capacitance is on the bottom there. So we can say that E2 is equal to the initial energy divided by six. Let's do the shortcut then. So we can say that the difference in energy is just gonna be E1 take away a six of E1. So therefore that's going to be, well, 5.6 C1. So that's 5.6 times 4.58 times 10 to the minus 9. Don't need to do the power of 10 when we do the calculation. And that gives us 3.8 to 2 sig figs times 10 to the minus 9 joules. Of course, if you just found out the actual energy, then just did the difference, that's fine as well. This is a neat little shortcut here. 1.4, we have this turny capacitor. We're being asked what happens when we turn it from zero to 180 to 360 degrees. So we're doing a full circle. 
so when it's zero, that's when they're in line with each other. So that's when we have the max. Of course, we're going to have that again at 360. So we're going to have a minimum at 180. And it should go down to zero because there should be no overlap of the two plates. So some people think that it's going to do this. It's going to curve like that. But no, that's not true. Because if you think about it, it's going to change linearly because we're just turning it at a constant rate. The area is changing at a constant rate when we turn it. 1.5, we're being asked, how could we have the same capacitance while only just having half the diameter? So we're going to, of course, use our equation, A epsilon zero, epsilon R divided by D. I guess we could just take out epsilon zero there. So we could say capacitance is proportional to, well, area, but I guess we should replace that with D squared, shouldn't we? Because we're talking about circles, epsilon R over D. Oh no, I have two diameters now. Oh, tell you what, if I replace that with capital D, there we go, crisis averted. Oh, we also want the same capacitance, don't we? There we go. So we can say two things here. We can say that epsilon R is proportional to, what's going to be distance between the place divided by diameter squared, and then also and then also the other way around, we can say that the distance between the plates is proportional to d squared epsilon r. So you have two different things going on. We can just say this is number one, this is number two. Therefore, if the diameter is halving, then that means that d squared goes down by a factor of four. And I guess we're forgetting about the distance between the plates for now. So therefore, we would need, in order to have the same capacitance, we'd need a relative permittivity of four. So we could say insert dielectric of relative permittivity of four. And then over here, well, again, we're just dealing with the distance between the plates. So therefore, if this goes down to a half, this goes down to a quarter, just like before. So that means that we would need to also divide the distance between the plates by four. So we would say decrease distance between plates by a factor of four or to a quarter. 2.1 we have GPS and we're being asked to show the angular speed of satellites is given by that easy we're told that the well the radius of the I'll tell you what if I say R of the actual GPS I don't know satellite let's put satellite is equal to the radius of the earth plus the height right whenever it comes to satellites the first thing we do is say force equals force so that is centripetal force so M now we could say mv squared over r, but because we have omega in the final version, we know we're probably going to have to use omega. And again, if it's a little bit time periods and stuff, we use omega. If we're looking for speeds, it's v. You'll end up using omega more than v, to be honest. And that's going to be this r that I've said, and that's equal to g m m over r squared. This r goes down here to make it r cubed. The little m's cancel. So therefore we can say that omega squared is equal to g m over r cubed. And so therefore omega squared is equal to g m over this radius of the earth plus that. Uh, so therefore square rooting that, we end up with the final form. Easy. 2.2, calculate the orbital period when h is equal to that. Easy, we're just going to use the equation that we've been given, so this equals to the square root of g, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, times the mass of the Earth, that's in a formula sheet. I know it's like, what, 6 times 10 to the, not quite, 5.97, there we go, times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Divide that by the radius of the Earth, so that is 6.37 times 10 to the 6, plus, what was the height? 2.02 times 10 to the 7. Okay, so let's just turn that into times 10 to the 6. So 20.2 times 10 to the 6. And that's got to be Q, doesn't it? So beastie calculation, don't mess up putting it in. It's going to be divided by 26.57 times 10 to the 6 cubed. And square root all of that. And I end up with something that's ridiculous. So I end up with an angular speed of 1.46 times 10 to the minus 4 radians per second. But 
we're not being asked for the angular speed, we're being asked for the period. We know that omega is equal to 2 pi f or 2 pi over t. So swapping these two round, we say that time period is equal to 2 pi over omega. And that gives us 43,124, or let's just go to two sig figs, 4.3 times 10 to the four seconds. 2.3, we have the orbit of this thingy. We have X, Y, and Z. We're being asked which one would require less fuel. Now, some people said that, oh, it's going to be Z because it's closer to the orbit, but that's not really what we want to be talking about, and it's not a huge difference. Not really, anyway. It's all to do with which one is going the fastest already. And so we can say that the bead here is going to be zero because it's just spinning around, as it were. It's not moving. And it's at the equator that it's already going round like that. And so it already has some speed in the right direction. It's got some velocity in the right direction. So we're going to say Z is the best one as it has the greatest velocity, we can say kinetic energy, due to the Earth's rotation. There we go. Two marks there. We said Z, and we're giving a reason why. 2.4 satellite has a mass of... 1,630 kilograms. Calculate the GPE of the satellite when in orbit in question 2.2. Oh, right. What did we say it was? Well, okay, for starters, potential energy is equal to G M M over R. Of course, that was our R plus H, wasn't it? So that's going to be equal to G times mass of the Earth times mass of the satellite divided by what was it again? 6.37 plus 20.2, that's right, times 10 to the 6. So I cancel some powers of 10, me think so. Take away 6 from 24, so we end up with 18. And then minus 11 plus 18, so we're just left with, well, plus 7. And we end up with 2.4 times 10 to the 10 joules. Yeah, Mark Scheme says minus. We don't really care because GPE is always just a change in GPE anyway. 2.5, different satellites, a higher circular orbit. What about the linear speed? Let's actually do this properly. Let's do mv squared over r is equal to gmm over r squared. One of the r's cancels, both the m's cancel, so therefore we're left with v is equal to square root of gmm over r. Therefore, if they're staying the same, then V is proportional to one over root R. So therefore, if R increases, V decreases. Simple as that. Question three, we have this apparatus confirm the distribution of atom speeds. The oven contains an ideal gas, atoms of the gas emerge from the passage. Okay, explain why the drum must be in a vacuum. So we can say to avoid atoms colliding with air atoms, which would change their speed. There we go. We could say speed distribution if you really wanted to. Dumb question, man alive. 3.2. One atom leaves the drum, drops in a straight line across the drum. One atom leaves the oven, enters the drum and travels in a straight line across the drum. In the time taken for the atom to move from S to detector AB, the drum rotates through 45 degrees. Oh my days. Okay, show that the atom is moving at a speed of about 500 meters per second. Okay, so we have the diameter. So I'm just going to say that that is 0 0.25 meters. And we have 120 revolutions per second. So we have a frequency of 120 hertz we're being asked to find the linear speed. Okay, so let's find out the time that it takes to actually rotate that 45 degrees, shall we? So we know that it's done, well, 45 degrees out of a whole circle. So 
like you know 45 divided by 360 it doesn't matter too much that's equal to an eighth of a rotation the time period is equal to 1 over 120 and so therefore if we're looking for the time it's going to be an eighth of that so it's going to be 1 over 120 times 8. that gives us a time of 1.04 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds okay and we know that speed equals distance over time uh, the distance is just the diameter which was 0.5 i guess i didn't need to turn it into radius did i i thought i'd be doing something with angular speed but nope so 0.5 divided by this time here it looks like it's going to give us it is isn't it it's going to give us something just a little bit smaller than 500 that is 400 and let's just say 80 meters per second. 3.3, speed of the atom is equal to the CRMS. Okay, so we're given CRMS, I'm just gonna call it C, 480 meters per second. The molar mass is 0 0.209 kilograms per mole. Estimate the temperature of the gas in the oven. Okay, so we know that EK is equal to half mv squared or half mc squared in this case and that's equal to three halves kt halves cancel so therefore temperature is equal to mc squared over 3k but m has to be the mass of an individual molecule or atom so therefore we need to turn this into that so we have kilograms per mole we just want to know kilograms per molecule so of course we have to divide by avogadro's so that is divide by 6.02 times 10 to the 23. And that gives us 3.47 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. So therefore, bringing these two things together, we can say the temperature is equal to 3.47 times 10 to the minus 25 times 480 squared divided by three lots of the Boltzmann constant. Powers of 10, why not? Minus 23, add that on top, we just end up with minus two. And we end up with the reasonable sounding temperature of 1,390 Kelvin. 3.4, temperature is kept constant, but the pressure is decreased. Explain using kinetic theory why the pressure decreases. We know that PV is equal to NRT. Volume is staying constant, temperature is staying constant. R stays constant, of course, so therefore we can say that P is proportional to N. So therefore, as atoms leave, N decreases. Therefore, so does P, but we're being asked to talk about it in terms of the actual kinetic theory. So we can say fewer atoms in oven, therefore frequency of collisions is reduced. Do we have to put anything else? Yeah, let's talk about it in terms of momentum, therefore Average change in momentum per second, and that is the same thing as force, is reduced. 3.5, we have the pressure to begin with, five times 10 to the four pascals. The volume is 2.7 times 10 to the minus two meters cubed. The pressure then increases to 4.5 times 10 to the 4 pascals. Calculating a mole, the amount of gas that has emerged from the oven. Okay, so we know the temperature as well, don't we? It's 1930 Kelvin. So we can use PV equals NRT. So therefore, the number of moles to begin with is going to be equal to P1V divided by RT. We know that N2 is going to be just the same just for P2 instead. So I guess we could just say that the difference in ends is going to be equal to that V over RT times P1 minus P2. Let's give that a go. So 0 0.027, that's our volume divided by 8.31 times 1930 times the difference in pressure, so what was that? So five times 10 to the four, let's just do five, take away 4.5, then times 10 to the four. 
Let's give that a go then. And that gives us, yeah, 8.42 times 10 to the minus three moles. So very similar to the capacitance question, isn't it? Finding that difference in energy. 3.6 atoms enter the drum every time S passes the hole. Detector darkens at the point where the atom strikes it. So here we can see the appearance of the detector. New detector is placed and the experiment is repeated with a new sample with new sample of the same gas at a higher temperature. Oh boy, okay, so let's have a look back at the original diagram. There's the drum and then there's the detector there. There's B, there's A. So here we can see that we have more marks here to begin with. And so that, and it's going around this way, isn't it? It's going around clockwise. Yeah, it has to be. Yep. Yeah. It's going around like that. So if they're faster, because they have a higher temperature, that means they're reaching the detector sooner. Therefore, we'll hit detector closer to A. So whereas we had most of the marks over here to begin with, this time we're going to have marks that are to the right. There we go. 4.1, we have this coil search coil next to this electromagnet. Okay, we have an N of 200 turns. We have a cross-sectional area of 3.5 times 10 to the minus five meters squared. Search coil is placed at X equals 0 0.07 meters. We're just being asked for the flux linkage so we can say n phi, and that's of course equal to b a n. All we need to do is find the flux density, and off the graph it looks like that's going to be 0 0.07 times the area times the number of turns. And that gives us bang on 4.9 times 10 to the minus 4. Wub turns, Weber turns. Okay, easy start, 4.2. Search coil is now moved at a constant speed along the axis. So X is increasing and EMF is induced. Explain what happens to the value of the EMF as the search coil moves. Well, we should know that just as we get further away from the magnet, the induced EMF should decrease. And we know that, shouldn't we? So let's say as coil moves, it experiences a change in flux, flux linkage, whatever, therefore, EMF induced. As X increases, the rate of change in flux decreases to zero eventually. Therefore, so does the EMF. 4.3, where now at X equals 0 0.1 meters. Deduce whether the EMF can exceed five millivolts for values of x greater than that. Well, basically we're just being asked for what is the EMF at that point? That's all we're being asked. So this is not an easy question. So yes, we have the cross-sectional area, don't we? And we have the number of turns. We've been asked for the EMF. EMF is equal to rate of change of flux like we see. So we can say ban over T or delta T. But what's changing in this situation? Well, it's B. So this is what we need to look at. So B over delta T. However, our graph is B against X. However, our graph is B against X. So you might be able to see that it's going to be something to do with the gradient. But the gradient is going to give us, the gradient is going to give us change in B over change in X, not over change in T. So this is one of those times when units see your friends. So here we have Teslas per second, and here we have Teslas per meter. But we want to get from Teslas per meter to Teslas per second. How can we do that? Of course, we can times by meters per second. So we times by V. So therefore, we can say that the EMF is equal to delta B over delta X, which is our gradient, times by V, that is that, 
and then times that by an. So in other words, gradient times van. So finding the gradient at that point, you should end up with something like 0 0.69 times that by the speed of 0 0.8 times that by the area and then n as well. And it gives me 3.9 times 10 to the minus 3 volts or 3.9 millivolts. So no. So there we go. Not an easy question that one. Possibly one of the hardest questions in the paper. What was the secret there? It's units, they're always your friends. So if you have two things that you don't know how to reconcile them, how do we go from one thing to another? Think, what units do you have? What units do you want to get to? So what are you gonna to have to times or divide by? 5.1, we have a cyclotron. Why does a proton travel in a semicircular path? It's because magnetic field produces force perpendicular to proton's velocity, therefore experiences centripetal force. Easy. 5.2 PD, we're told, is 10 kilovolts. We're told it's the peak PD, but that's all we care about when it crosses. So 10 kilovolts, so one times 10 to the four volts. Proton leaves with an energy of 14 mega electron volts. Determine the number of times the proton moves across the gap before it leaves the cyclotron. Now you might be tempted to turn mega electron volts into joules, but actually we know that the energy of any charged particle that's accelerated through PD is equal to EV. Therefore, if a proton or an electron, anything with just a charge of E, so if plus E or minus E accelerated by one volt, energy equals one electron volt. So therefore, all we have to do is say that, well, if it crosses once, then it has an energy of one times 10 to the four electron volts. So therefore, this is just a ratio. It's just gonna be 14 times 10 to the six mega electron volts divided by one times 10 to the four electron volts, that is per crossing. And we just end up with, well, that's just gonna be 14 times 10 to the two. Caught a lot of people out of that question but it is only a one mark question, so you can probably see that it's not going to involve lots of calculations. 5.3 show that EK is given by this. Well, we know that EK is equal to half mv squared, but how does that help us? Well, it is a cyclotron, things going in circles, so let's equate forces like we always do. So we know that mv squared over r is equal to bqv. One of the v's cancels, so therefore we can see that V is equal to B Q R over M. So therefore let's substitute that in there. So therefore we can see that EK is equal to half times M times B squared Q squared R squared over M squared. One of those M's cancels and sure enough, we end up with the right equation. If of course we replace Q with just E, they use a capital R don't they? or in other words, b squared, e squared, r squared over two m. Easy. Things going in circle, always equate forces, that's it. 5.4, oh, this question sucks. <laughs> yes, this is definitely the hardest question in the paper. Okay, so we're told that the cost is approximately equal to ek to the power of 1.5. So we're told that a 10 mega electron volt cyclotron is worth 2.3 million pounds. So we're being asked to use which cyclotron will satisfy the energy requirement for the lowest cost. And we're being asked to determine the cost. So let's use the equation that we just derived. So E squared B squared R squared over two MP. Okay, so let's figure out what B and R we need to begin with. So let's rearrange this so we can say that B squared R squared is equal to 2M EK. I'm just gonna call that E divided by E squared. So that is two times the mass of a proton times the minimum energy, which is 11 mega electron volts. So 11 times 1.6 
times 10 to the minus 13 divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 squared. Yes, I could tidy this up, couldn't I, with, you know, we have E on top of the bottom, but uh, I'm not going to do that now. Okay, so I end up with a B squared R squared that must equal 0 0.23, or in other words, a BR that must equal the square root of that, which is 0 0.479. And there are a couple of ways of doing this question, aren't there? So let's look at X, 1.3 times 0 0.38, that gives us 0 0.49, so yes, that's okay. Y that gives us 0 0.55, so that's fine. And well, I can see that 0 0.5 times 0 0.6 is definitely not gonna give us that. So Z is not good, but X and Y are. But now we wanna know which one is going to be the cheapest out of the two. Well, the lowest cost is gonna be X, isn't it? But we wanna know the cost. So we're told that the cost of a cyclotron is approximately proportional to that. So I'm going to say, Pounds proportional to EK to the 1.5, okay? So what can we say then? We can say that the cost of one cyclotron divided by the energy to the power of 1.5 is equal to that for X. So there we go. We're looking for this. So therefore we can say that the cost of X is gonna be equal to cost for this one that we saw, so 2.3 million, times the ratio of our unknowns. I'm just gonna combine them there, power of 1.5. So that's equal to 2.3 million, but it's just relative, so we don't care about that, times, what was the energy? Oh, I guess I do need to find out the energy, don't I? I do want it in mega electron volts, so for X, that's gonna be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 squared times 1.3 squared times 0.38 squared divided by two lots of the mass, two lots of the mass of a proton. And then I need to divide that by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. So I'll tell you what, I'm just going to divide by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 and then minus 13 as well. So one of these cancels, one of these cancels minus 13, minus 27, so that ends up just being minus 40. So that all disappears. Tell you what, should we put 40 on top as well? So 40 added on to 19, so that ends up being times 10 to the 21. So I have 1.6 times 10 to the 21, times 1.3 squared, times 0 0.38 squared, divided by two times 1.67. I wanna turn that into mega electron volts, so I'm going to then divide again by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. Yeah, I guess I could tidy this up a little bit, but I'm not going to. And that gives us 11.7 mega electron volts. Okay, so we have the energy for X, it's that. So therefore it's gonna be 11.7 divided by, what was it? It was just 11 for our one that we already have made. And that was a 10 mega electron volt cyclotron that we already have made. So that's just gonna be 2.3 times 1.17 to the 1.5. And that gives us 2.9 million pound. Really, really tricky question there. Explain in terms of binding energy what energy is released when two nuclei undergo fusion. When nuclei fuse, their mass decreases, therefore binding energy increases. And we can just say energy released is equal to difference in binding energy. Easy. 6.2. We'd be nice to find the energy released in this situation. So it's just going to be the difference in all of this. Going to find the mass defect to begin with. So we're just going to do the mass afterwards. Take away the mass to begin with. Total mass. That is. And that gives us a mass defect of 0 0.02272 and that is U. Now we could turn that into kilograms and then use E equals MC squared, but we have a shortcut. We can get to mega electron volts by times in by 931.5. That's on the formula sheet, might as well use it. 
that gives us 21 point, let's go to four sig figs, I guess. So one, six mega electron volts. We want this in joules, so therefore all we have to do then is times by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13, because it's mega electron volts and we know we're times in because we want a smaller number. And that gives us three point, let's go to three sig figs. 3.39 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. 6.3, fusion occurs when they're separated by a distance of 5.1 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. That is their centers. Calculate the total change in electrostatic potential energy between the initial positions and final positions. Well, we're told that it's a very large distance to begin with, so we're not concerned about the potential energy to begin with, but then we are afterwards. We know the potential energy is equal to KQ Q over R. In this case, it's going to be D. So that is nine times 10 to the nine. That's our shortcut. We don't need to go with one over four pi epsilon zero because it is the three sig figs 9.00. So nine times 10 to the nine times, and then we have a helium nucleus. And so that's going to be, oh, it's helium three. Not that that matters. So it's a helium nucleus, so we have two. And then I'm going to take the shortcut. I'm going to say then eight, and then we can times that by what each of those is. But if you do that, don't forget to square the E at the end. Lots of people forget to do that. Divided by the distance as 5.1 times 10 to the minus 15. Don't think there's much point in tidying up powers of 10 in this case. And we end up with 7.2, I'm gonna get with 7.2 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. 6.4. Helium can undergo fission with sulfur or oxygen. Nucleus has properties that depends on its proton number, blah, blah, blah. The nucleus has properties that depend on its proton number and its nucleon number. Properties affect the fusion reaction. Discuss for this start how properties affect the rate of fusion of that. Okay. What we need to say, first of all, is that bigger nucleon number A equals bigger radius. As we know from our equation, r is equal to our zero a to the third. I guess we might as well do a calculation with this. This is not an easy question, by the way. So we can say that r is proportional to a to the third. Therefore, if sulfur has double the nucleons, then we can say that its radius is cube root, or two to the third, that of oxygen. Okay, so all we're doing is sticking a two in there, isn't it? All we're doing is sticking a two in there, isn't it? Ah, oh, but then we'd have to go into comparing it with helium. Do we really have to do that? The Mars scheme starts going down this route, but not really, but then it stops halfway, so I don't know. I think we've probably done enough calculation there. So we can also say that Sulfur has a charge double that of oxygen two. And so therefore, if we know that they need to get within a certain distance, we know that, well, the kinetic energy needed has to be equal to the potential energy, which is KQQ over R. Therefore, it must have double the energy as KE to get to same distance or separation. Are we really going to then combine these two ideas? The fact that it needs more kinetic energy, but it doesn't need to get as far apart. I don't know. But I guess what we can say, we, we can compare these two ideas that, that it doesn't need to get to within quite as close a distance, but then it does need twice the energy to get to within that distance. Okay, so I tell you what, you know what? Let's actually deal with the actual equation, shall we? So we can say that EK needed is proportional to Q over R. But then for sulfur compared to oxygen, its charge is going up by times two, but then its distance is only going up by two to the third. So that's two to the one. So basically it needs two to the two thirds more energy. Yes, we know that we have to take into account the fact that we have the radius of the helium nucleus as well, but basically sulfur needs more energy, higher EK, to touch helium nucleus. Therefore, we can say rate of fusion for it with helium 
is less. There we go. Okay, multiple choice, my favorite. Question seven, we have a power of 1.2 kilowatts. Liquid has a specific heat capacity of four kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. When the liquid flows through, its temperature increases by three Kelvin. Flow rate is that. So this is one of those times when units are your friends. So this is joules per second. We're looking for kilograms per second. So what if we do, so that's joules per second. We want to get rid of the joules. So we're obviously going to divide by, oh, that's kilojoules, isn't it? There we go. We're going to divide by four kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Okay, so if you do this, then the kilojoules cancel and we end up with, well, kilograms, because that just ends up on top, Kelvin, seconds to the minus one. We need to get rid of the Kelvin, so if we divide then by three Kelvin, then they cancel and we end up with just kilograms per second. So the answer should be 1.2 divided by four times three. So in other words, 1.2 divided by 12. So the answer is 0 0.1 kilograms per second. Not a super easy question. Eight, we have volume V, they have CRMS of U. Okay, so obviously we know that PV is equal to NRT. And we also know that kinetic energy is equal to three halves KT. And so actually, well, if we know that half M, well, U squared in this case is equal to three halves KT, everything else is staying the same. But if temperature is staying the same, then that means that U squared and therefore U has to be staying the same as well. So this is a trick question. The speed of the particles is gonna stay the same. If the temperature is staying the same, then the kinetic energy is staying the same, speed is staying the same. Now we have the classic graph that you probably got from your experiment. So it's heated at a constant volume. So therefore temperature is going to be along the x-axis, isn't it? However, is it going to be Kelvin? Well, no, it's not because it's zero here. So this is going to be minus 273 down here. So therefore that has to be in degree C and therefore it has to be pressure that's up here. So therefore the answer has to be B. Oh, what is the root mean square speed of all of the particles? How interesting. So what we do is add up all of the speeds squared, divide by the number of that we have, that's three, and then square root of all that. And that gives us 4.3 meters per second. That's how we calculate a root mean square. 11, which point has the greatest gravitational field strength? Well, of course, these are equipotentials, aren't they? And so it's gonna be where the lines are closest together. So that's gonna be B. 12, planet has radius R, oh, gravitational field strength, okay. Gravitational field strength is equal to GM over R squared. So therefore, well, we say that G is proportional to M over R squared. Density is equal to mass over volume. So therefore it's proportional to mass over R cubed. Reconciling these two, we can say that field strength is proportional to rho R. So therefore, if that doubles and that doubles, then that must mean that G goes up by a factor of four. So the answer is B. 13. Object is moved from P to Q. So that means that it's moved up 12 meters. That's our distance. It's not from P to Q, is it? Because we're not moving against any forces if we're going sideways. See, the mass is four kilograms. So therefore we can say that work done is equal to force times distance. Force is equal to MA. So if the total change in potential is three joules per kilogram, then that means our change of potential is just gonna be that times just 12 over 20. Therefore, change in energy or work done, whatever you wanna call it, is equal to M delta V. So that is four kilograms times three times 12 divided by 20. And that gives us 7.2 joules. So the answer is A. 14, we have plus Q and minus Q, and the separation is D. But then we're going to plus three Q and plus Q because we're adding two Q to each of these and their separation is increased to 2D. So the equation is F is equal to or proportional to whatever, let's go with equal to K Q on Q2 over D squared. So we're going from one, two, three. This is staying the same, even though it's positive instead of negative and this times by two. So therefore this times by four. So the answer is gonna be three quarters. 
So the answer should be D. 15, two protons separated by distance R. The electrostatic force between two protons is X times greater than the gravitational force. Okay, so we know that F is equal to KQ Q over R. Uh, F is also equal to GMM over R. So I think we can probably ballpark this one because the answers are so different. K is, well, 9 times 10 to the 9, so I'm going to say times 10 to the 10. K is times 10 to the 10. That's the order of magnitude. 9 times 10 to the 9, basically 1 times 10 to the 10. We have minus 19, minus 19. Don't care about that because it's staying the same for both, of course. So that gives us a relative order of magnitude of minus 28. Gravitational force, on the other hand, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Let's call that 12 then. Mass is minus 27, minus 27. So that's 42. So this gives us minus 64. So therefore, going from here to here, because that's what we've been asked, how much greater is the electrostatic force? That's going to be times 10 to the 36. So the answer is C. 16, what's the magnitude of the electrostatic force on the particle trick question? We know that F is equal to EQ, where E is equal to V over D. And that's going to be the same everywhere. Parallel plates, uniform field, so it's not going to be any different anywhere. So the answer is C. 17, classic question. Put minus 6 microcoulombs and plus 4 microcoulombs. That's 120 mil. And then we're being asked for the point where the electric potential is zero. We're looking for this distance here, P to Q. So we're going to equate potential for both of these. So KQ over R1 is equal to KQ2 over R2. K is cancel. We're going to call this R here. So therefore this becomes this 120. So therefore R2 becomes just 120 minus R1. So let's swap these two rounds. So we end up with 120. I'm just going to call it R now. Over R is equal to Q2 over Q1. Therefore 120 over R minus 1 equals Q2 over Q1. Just add the 1 to the other side. So 120 over R is equal to... Well, 4 over 6 plus 1, so that's basically 1.7. Therefore, R is going to be 120 over 1.7. And we end up with roughly 72. So the answer is D. 18, what's the electric field strength and electric potential at T? Well, we know that V is proportional to 1 over R. What's happened to R? That's multiplied by 3. What's happened to R? That's multiplied by 3. So therefore, potential must go to a third. Electric field strength, E is proportional to 1 over R squared. So if that's gone to times 3, this has gone to times 9, so therefore this must go to a 9. Therefore the answer must be D. Okay, what's true about this setup here? Let's check A. The work done moving an electron from M to K is the same as that moving it from K to L. Note that's not true because L to K is an equipotential. There should be no work done in that case. K to M is the work done in moving a positron from K to M is the same as that done moving an electron from K to M. Well, no, because it's going to be the opposite, isn't it? It's going to be minus. So, yes, same amount of energy, overall magnitude, but it's going to be energy in as opposed to energy out. No work is done in moving an electron from M to N. That is true. It's a long enough potential. That has to be true. D, well, L to N, no, that's a longer field line. Definitely have to do work in that case. Capacitor is uncharged, we then start to charge it. Of course, we know that V is going to increase like that over time, whereas current is going to start very large and then decrease. So the answer has to be D. Very easy question. 21, copper rails, blah, 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 blah. When switch S is closed, R will tend to, well, if the field is going to the right, let's get our left hand out. So field is going to the right like that current is going to be going well actually this way isn't it because the current's going like that down the rod and then coming back and so therefore thumb is going to be pointing upwards oh my days this is the worst blooming hand this upwards so basically yes it's going to be moving up up away from the rails so the answer is a please don't drag my hand drawing in the comments too much question 22 what can we do to producing the EMF. Let's check out the first one. Moving it to the left. No, that's not going to work because it's not experiencing a change in 
flux moving it towards y same thing that's not going to work rotating it about axis yy yes because it is going to go from lots of flux to zero flux so that is true the last one rotating it about z so that it's point the no oh, so we're literally just talking about like rotating it that way no that's not going to work again it's not experiencing a change in flux so the answer is just going to be one of them the answer is a mains electricity is 230 what is correct the mean voltage is 163 don't forget that 230 is the rms voltage so let's see a the mean voltage is 163 the rms voltage is yes but the mean voltage is actually zero talking about being mean that is quite mean peak voltage no like we said it's the rms voltage C, the root mean square voltage is 3 to 5. No, because we know it can't be larger, because we know that's going to be the peak. Speaking of the peak, yes, if we know that it's 325 up there to the peak, then peak to peak is going to be 650. So therefore, the answer has to be D. We have two resistors. In a resistor resistance, ah, oh, there's an alternating. Oh, my days. Right. So what is the mean power dissipated in the resistor? Okay, so power is equal to what well, we're dealing with i squared r aren't we so therefore if the root mean square value is 3i then therefore that's going up by 3 so therefore this goes up by times 9 r is going down to a half so therefore altogether we should be going up by times 4.5 well it's just 9 over 2 so therefore the answer has to be b because remember whenever we do power it has to be rms values unless we're looking for a peak power but we don't generally do that so we have N1, no, N, yeah, N1 is 200, N2 is 1600. Root mean square to the primary winding is 25 volts. And we're looking for V2 and we're looking for I2 and we have I1 being four amps. We can see that, of course, power is equal to VI, so that's 100 watts 25 times 4 but then of course it is only 90 percent efficient so there's going to be 90 watts going to the secondary coil as it were so therefore we need to find out v2 for starters so we can say that we know the ratio of voltages is equal to the ratio of turns doesn't matter which way around we do it so therefore we're looking for that so therefore this is going to be 1600 over 200 times by 25 so it's 8 times 25, so the answer is going to be 200 volts. And then just to find out the power, we can say that current is equal to power divided by voltage. So that's 90 divided by 200. And we can see that's going to be uh, 0.45. Um, so they've given us the 0.5 there in A to try and throw us off, just in case we forgot about the efficiency. So just looking at the answers, we can tell that that has to be the right answer. 26. What is not true about the proton at P? So rate of change of momentum is at a minimum. Rate of change of momentum is force. Wait, so that's the right answer. So we know rate of change of momentum is the same thing as force. We know the force has to be greatest at that point. That isn't true. So therefore that is our right answer. B, kinetic energy at a minimum, yes, because it's traveling the slowest. Potential energy is at a maximum, yes, because it's closest to the nucleus. Acceleration is at a maximum, yes, because the force is at a maximum. Noise. 27. So we have an area of 0 0.1 meters squared. The distance is 2 meters. The source emits 5,000 gamma photons per second. Photons per second. How many photons pass through the area every second? Okay, so I always say that imagine what it would be like if you had a detector that was surrounding all of the area, the whole thing, so like a sphere. So the area of a sphere is four pi r, let's call that r actually, squared. So therefore we can say that 5,000 divided by this whole area, four pi r squared, is equal to the count rate for the smaller area of that. I am taking a couple of shortcuts there, but hopefully that makes sense. So just putting that over the other side, so that ends up being 500 divided by four pi times two squared. So that's just gonna be 500 divided by 16 pi. And that gives us 9.9, .9, so we're gonna say that's about 10. So the answer is C. All I did was say 
those 5,000 photons must be going through an area of the sphere. And so that's going to be proportional to the actual count rate in the smaller area. That's all. 28 X and Y are radioactive. Okay, so we're told the half-life for X, can I just call it that, is equal to three minutes, and the half-life for Y is equal to nine minutes. After 18 minutes, the number of radioactive nuclei in both samples is the same. Ooh, okay, so basically the question is how many half-lives, and so 18 minutes is six half-lives for this one, and this one is two half-lives. So therefore, if we end up with, say, one left, then that means going back in time, six half-lives, which is going to be 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then two half-lives is just going to be going 2, 4. And so we had 64 in X to begin with, 4 in Y to begin with. Therefore, 64 divided by 4 gives us 16n. That's not super easy though. 29, what is the purpose of a moderator? It is to slow down neutrons to make sure that they are able to be absorbed by fuel rods. So the answer is C. 30, we have a decrease in mass of nine times 10 to the minus six kilograms per hour. So I'll tell you what, shall we turn that into kilograms per second? We think so. So we're going to divide by 3,600. That gives us 2.5 times 10 to the minus nine kilograms per second. We know that E is equal to MC squared and power is equal to energy divided by time. So we can just take MC squared divided by time. So actually that's that. So we can just say 2.5 times 10 to the minus nine times C squared. So nine times 10 to the 16. Let's tell you, some powers of 10. Why not? So this just ends up being seven. So two, oh, I don't even need a calculator for this. So 2.5, so 18 and 22.5 times 10 to the seven, or in other words, 2.25 times 10 to the eight watts. So the answer is A. Look at me. Oh gosh, this is complicated. Magnesium can decay, blah, blah, blah. The diagram shows the energy levels, right? One root results in the emission of a gamma photon with higher frequency than the other photon. What is the maximum possible kinetic energy for the beta particle emitted in this root? Right. So the max beta minus energy is when we have min aluminium energy. And so therefore we're looking at that 1.33 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So there's only 4.18 times 10 to the minus 13 joules available altogether. And so if we're looking for the maximum energy of the beta particle that goes off, then we're taking away 1.33, right? And that leaves us with 2.85 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So the answer has to be D, right? The mark scheme says that it's C. Oh, but those jerks at AQA, they've done it again. They're talking about just the root where the higher frequency is produced. And so therefore we're talking about going down to here. And then when that drop happens, we get the photon with a greater frequency produced. So basically we're being told to ignore the 1.33 times 10 to the minus 13 joule energy level. So therefore, no, it's not take away 1.33 is take away. 1.63 and so that leaves us with 2.55 times 10 to the minus 13 joules and so the answer is c there we go what a terrible way to end the paper like i said leave a like if you find it helpful click on the super thanks if you want to buy me a cup of tea to help me keep going making these videos join the discord if you need some help from some uh, fairly clever people over there click on the card if you want to go to the playlist with all of the a-level papers on good luck with your studies see you next time